Okay. So, since we're at the seven o'clock mark, um, we're going to get started tonight. I want to thank you all for joining us. We're really happy to see your faces yet again, or most of you, some of you have your video off. Um, we hope you enjoyed the competitions the past three days. Um, today, we know we had some great field trips planned for you for Mississippi, and that was something that we were really sad you weren't going to be able to partake in. So think of today's presentation um, as your virtual finals field trip uh, where you get to explore the Galapagos with our speaker tonight. So um, Dr. Ellen Prager, we have to really thank her for joining us tonight and providing this presentation. Um, she has had an amazing career as a scientist and an author, and she's very dedicated to science communication. So she spends a lot of time and effort making sure that science is both fun and um, understandable for people of all ages. She was also previously the chief scientist of the Aquarius Reef Base in Key Largo, Florida. I know that's been a competition question in the past about that. Um, and she was also the assistant dean for the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. Tonight, she is going to present on the wonders of the Galapagos. So she's going to be discussing the Galapagos, uh, its unique wildlife, and um, how she integrated the science of both the setting and the creatures that live there into her new book. So um, join us in thanking her uh, for presenting. Uh, what we're going to do is she's going to go through her presentation. And at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A. So, um, you can either use the chat box, which I see you guys are already using to say hello to each other, that's awesome, um, or you can raise your hand. So if there's a point in the presentation where she's going to take a break, she may ask her questions, otherwise we'll keep them all to the end when she's done, okay? But feel free if you don't want to forget your question to enter that into the chat box, or like I said, raise your hand and we'll call on you and then you can unmute yourself and ask your question live, okay? All right, so Ellen, we're going to turn it over to you. Okay, well thanks. Hey everybody and congratulations on the competition. I'm so glad that you were so able to do it. So that, that was really great. Um, it's, it's fun to be here. I wish I was there in person with all of you. That's always so much fun with NOSB. Um, but I'm hoping I can sort of do a little virtual field trip for you to the Galapagos, one of my favorite places. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen because I've got a, a cool PowerPoint that I want to um, share with you. So let me get that going. And there we are. Let's see. Assuming everybody can see that now. Um, Melissa, just do yes. <laughs> yep. Okay. So I wanted to start because with this slide, because you heard my career has been sort of, I would like to call it an unexpected career path. You know, when I, after when I was in graduate school even, I thought I was going to be a typical researcher and teaching. And um, as I started taking on different jobs and doing different things, it just brought me in different directions. Like you heard, I was the um, chief scientist for the Aquarius Reef Base, shown right here. That's the outside of, off of Key Largo. And I did two missions where I lived underwater, one for two weeks studying coral reefs, which was really cool. Um, I loved it. I love living underwater and uh, being able to spend six to nine hours a day diving, which was fantastic. Um, I also work, some of you may know about Sea Education Association in Woods Hole, where I taught oceanography. And here you can see that one of their tall ships, where I took my students out to sea for six weeks at a time to study oceanography, which was fantastic. Um, I've gone down in small submersibles, spent a lot of time diving. And one of the sort of unexpected things that happened is Somehow, when things happen in regard to the oceans, a lot of times the, the networks call me to go on air on television as an ocean expert. And, you know, I always laugh because they always call when bad things happen, like a tsunami or, you know, an oil spill. I'm like, can't you guys call me when something good happens? I've come like the disaster diva. You know, can I have something good? Call me when there are good things with the ocean. And then, then one of probably, some people might think it's been the height of my career, but one day I also got a call from Disney and they asked me to be a consultant on the movie Moana. And so that was probably one of the coolest things I've gotten to do. Um, I really, that was really fun. And another unexpected thing is I started writing popular science and children's books and, and that was never something I imagined. But I think, you know, for me, as I went along with my career, I discovered that I really love writing science for non-scientists, whether it's young kids or adults. And so that, really became a big emphasis on my, in my career, 
but again, it was not something that I really imagined. It kind of, because um, I kind of discovered it was a strength and there was a huge need for it. And so that kind of took me down that path. And of course, the Galapagos. So um, the Galapagos, I've been going there since the 1980s. This is actually, this is a real video from a volcanic eruption in 2015 taken from one of the ships that I work on. Unfortunately, I wasn't there to see it, but it's still pretty cool. So uh, most people, when they think about the Galapagos, they think about Charles Darwin and the voyage of the Beagle and how you know, he discovered that the beaks of the finches were different on different islands and it came up, that's how he came up with his theories of evolution and survival of the fittest. But for me, my first time, as I said, was there is in the 1980s. And I went there with a team of scientists to study the impact of El Nino on corals. Now in the 1980s, there were no cruise ships down there. There was only one hotel on the island. There were only a couple restaurants. It was, like, it was pretty tough being in the field in the Galapagos in the 1980s. We would be diving all day in cold water. And then when we got back to our cabins, we only had cold, sulfur-smelling showers. You would go to bed at night, and you'd look up on the ceiling in the cabin, and there would be these giant spiders all over the ceiling. And so, you know, that, that wasn't so great. But what was really bad was in the morning, you'd wake up, and all the spiders would be gone. And so you were kind of like, well, where'd they go? Food was pretty sparse. We never knew what we were, sometimes we didn't even know what we were eating. Our equipment kept failing. And then, had a very unexpected problem. So when you do field work in the ocean, there's a couple things you plan for. You plan for bad weather, it's probably gonna strike at some point, and your boat's probably gonna break down. You're gonna have mechanical problems or your equipment's gonna fail, and so you always think about bringing spare parts. But here's something that we didn't really expect. Turns out that the, the, the juveniles and the pups and the young female sea lions in the Galapagos are very playful and they loved our survey gear. And so this is actually a photo of a sea lion trying to steal the camera from my buddy. And so there were times when there was one time when I was actually lying on the bottom and I, had a, I could see my buddy and there was something pulling my fins and I was like turning around like, what the heck is that? It was a sea lion. And one of their favorite things to do is this. They like to swim right up to you and blow bubbles right in your face. And it's kind of like, you know, we're really good at this underwater thing. You, eh, not so much. So the sea lions were probably the best problem I've ever had being doing field work in the ocean. So what that led to, again, sort of unexpected career path, was about 10 years ago, Celebrity Cruise Lines decided to have small expedition ship in the Galapagos. And they ended up hiring me as a consultant. And I've been going back to the Galapagos two to three times a year now with celebrity. Oh, it's awful. Not really. I love it. Um, as a consultant for them. So, you know, one of the guys, things that you guys should think about is, you know, we always think of these typical career paths or jobs. There are a lot of things out there that you can make your own. And that's what I kind of think with this job is that I, over the years, I've sort of made it my own and I do different things for them. But my, my principal job has been, I go down and I work with the naturalists, I train them on things about the ocean and marine life and some of the geology. Um, I, I have created all of the briefings and on some of the scientific lectures on board. So it, I kind of created the job in a way for myself and they bought into it. So you never know when there are opportunities that come up that you should always try and take advantage of something that you want to you want to do. So a little more about the Galapagos. One of my favorite things is we can do a lot of snorkeling. I've done some diving, but it's great. So you're there and you're snorkeling. You see sea turtles, tropical fish, white tip reef sharks, and then a penguin swims by. And you're like, what? You got warm water and cold water animals living together. So I love to say it's my strange neighbors and the penguins are the cutest things there the smallest, the second smallest penguins in the world, and the farthest northern penguins. And they're only about, like I wanna say about nine inches tall. And they're really cute. The other thing that's really cool about the Galapagos is the animals are very well protected by the Galapagos National Park. And so they're unafraid of you. And so you can get really close up to the animals and photographs without long lenses. And so they, cause they're not scared, they don't run away. And that's, I think one of the really cool things about it. So 
This is a blue-footed booby. Oops. It's a blue-footed booby, a uh, land iguana, a frigate bird with its throat pouch. That's the male with its throat pouch blown up, an albatross, and of course, the giant tortoise. But not only can you, can you see, but you can't get, you're not supposed to get any closer than six feet. But again, with cameras, you can get great shots. And look at this, you can get really close to the chicks too. So the one, let's see, the one in the upper left is a frigate bird chick. You can see all that down. It's just starting again in its feathers. We call that the awkward teenager's phase because they have some down, but some feathers too. There's a, a let's see, a swallowtail gull on the right. Um, you look at the little chick. And of course, the one on the bottom is a penguin, the little chick. And you can see, it's got like, it was really funny. Um, I was giving a talk to some younger kids and I showed that picture and one of the kids yells out and goes, he's got an afro, because the penguin looks like he has an afro. It was pretty cute. And you never know what's gonna happen. So we see, every time I go down, I see different behaviors and sometimes things that are really unexpected. So this is a place called Elizabeth Bay. It's a secluded uh, mangrove ecosystem. You're not allowed to go hiking in there or swimming. The only thing you can do here is go for a Zodiac ride. And so we were in there, we had the, the engine was in neutral um, and the sea lion came by it. No, we had never seen them do this. Even the drivers who were there all the time never seen them. And you'll see there's water that's circulating through the engine. That's just cooling water. It's still salt water, but watch this. It's the cutest thing ever. And we had never seen them do this before. Now he's not drinking the water, but they have very sensitive whiskers. And so they like the feel of the water on their whiskers, but <laughs> it's not funny. So you never know what kind of behavior, what sort of funny behaviors you're gonna see when you're down there. And, and that's one of the nice things. Um, so I'm sure most of you know this, the Galapagos are about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. Um, they're owned by the Ecuador. Ecuador. Um, they straddle the equator and they're an archipelago of islands. And so it depends on what your definition of an island is, about how many there are. But this is, those are the main islands. Um, and I've got a little movie. Actually, let me go back and introduce this for a second. Um, I've got a little movie about the, the origin of the Galapagos Islands that we created for Celebrity's newest ship. It's only about two minutes. But I think it does a really nice job about setting the stage of the hot spot because it's, it's a lot like Hawaii. So I'm just going to play this for you. Oops. 600 miles to the west of Ecuador lay the Galapagos Islands. It is a place born of fire, the result of volcanic upheavals that build and shape the land. The Galapagos are the product of one of the world's mysterious hot spots where deep below in the Earth's interior it is hot, hotter than the surrounding Earth. Fueled by this heat and lower density, magma or molten rock rises towards the surface. It flows through fractures already present or breaks its way upward. Once the magma reaches the surface, it becomes lava. In the Galapagos, as in Hawaii, the lava is made of basalt, poor in silica, but rich in iron and magnesium. This type of lava flows faster and greater distances. Over time, multiple eruptions of lava create the towering and wide shield volcanoes of the Galapagos. Here, eruptions can eject ash and rock into the air, which form cinder, scoria, or spatter cones. The lava winds its way over land and sometimes reaches the ocean. Along the way, it creates tunnels or strange ropey surfaces. In the Galapagos, like Hawaii, the underlying hotspot is stationary, but at the surface, the Earth's tectonic plates move and the volcanoes are transported away from the hot spot. Eventually, the volcanoes become inactive and cool. The islands sink into the underlying mantle and erosion and weathering wear away at the surface. Over time, vegetation takes hold and spreads across the islands. Animals arrive and populate the shores. After millions of years, the island's volcanic origin is hidden from view. So 
kind of a cool little video that we created to help explain um, the origin of the islands, much, much like Hawaii. But what's kind of cool is that in Hawaii, it's a distinct line, a chain of islands that's created. In the Galapagos, the hotspot is more spread out. It's more like a wedge. And so it's not a distinct line of, a, a line of islands, uh, but, it, but it's the same sort of idea. The other thing that's interesting about the Galapagos is that it's in the middle of the confluence of a number of currents. So you've got uh, the Panama Current, which brings warm water down and bays the Galapagos. You've got cold water coming up from, the, from Peru, the Peru Oceanic Current. And then you also have the equatorial undercurrent, which is maybe the most important uh, current in the Galapagos. And what happens here is that there's a submerged current that flows eastward across the equator at depth. It hits the base of the volcanoes in the Galapagos, and that causes upwelling, which I know from your studies for the, for the NOSB, I know you guys all know what upwelling is. So it brings new, cold, nutrient-rich water up to the surface on the, in the Western islands. And that's one of the reasons why the Galapagos are so productive is because of that upwelling. And with all those nutrients, you get a bloom of plankton um, in the Western Islands. And this is a really cool, let's see if I can get this movie going, um, movie from Richard Kirby, who does really great photography of plankton through microscopes. So I, I just love to show this because this, I've never seen anybody create, do such good close-ups of plankton. <clears throat> But so the plankton are obviously the base of the food web in the Galapagos. Oh, look at that. That's a cool arrow worm. And look at that crab. <clears throat> so, so that is the base of the food web in the Galapagos. Now, the things that take advantage of the plankton, one of the things are what are called the salima. And the salima are like the Galapagos anchovy or menhaden. They're very, very common small fish. They were only found in the Galapagos, and that's the black striped uh, fish. And I've seen schools of salima so dense that they look black, like black clouds underwater. And those are what a lot of the animals feed on. The penguins feed on them, the boobies feed on them, the sea lions feed on them, but the salima eat the plankton, and the other animals eat the salima. And as I said, one of the animals that depend on the salima are the blue-footed boobies, which everybody loves, of course. And one of the questions I get all the time is why are their feet blue? So there's a reason, there's two kinds of reasons. One is they're blue and it's because the brighter the blue feet on the males is what attracts the females. And it was really interesting. Some scientists did an experiment where they withheld food from the blue-footed boobies and they, they were still blue, but the brightness of the blue faded. So what that means is that when they have really bright blue feet, that means they're very healthy, and so essentially they're good genetic stock, and so they're attractive to the females. Now, the other part of why are they blue is, is it, people ask, well, is it what they eat, like a flamingo? No, it turns out it's the structure of their feet. So it's like how the sky is blue because of light scattering. The same is true with the blue-footed boobies' feet. Light is scattered, and that's why they look blue, by the structure of the feet. And here's another little cool movie of, you can see what the males and the females do is they dance. This is their courtship dance and they're showing each other their feet. So, you know, they'll be walking around and here comes another one and they'll see how they pick up their feet. They're saying, I have the best feet. You should mate with me. And they're really fun. You're also gonna see the male, the male's whistle. And he's gonna do something called sky pointing right there. And that's a way, another way to attract the females and the females honk. So it's one of the ways you can tell the difference between the male and the female. The males whistle and the females honk. So the one that just did that on the right is the male. So yeah, so there, that's pretty funny. Some of the other really cool birds in the Galapagos, there's also something called the Nazca booby. And you guys probably know Nazca comes from the Nazca plate, which is where the Galapagos are. Um, there's a red-billed tropic bird. And they are these re they're very fast flyers and they nest in the cliffs. And the, the um, naturalist in the Galapagos, it's kind of like the holy grail of photography of birds because they're so fast that the, every, every trip they're always trying to, who can get the best red-billed tropic bird picture? And the other um, picture here is a Galapagos hawk, and they are one of the top predators in the Galapagos. 
One of the interesting things about the Galapagos is it's not really a predator prey limited system. It's more limited by resources. When things are really productive in the water, everything blooms, everything starts uh, reproducing. When things are not productive in the water, a lot dies. It's not like the fish numbers aren't controlled by predator prey relationship necessarily. But you can see the hawks, just like everything else, they're really unafraid and they will sit right near you um, looking for things to eat. And one of my favorite animals or birds in, in the Gulf because is the waved albatross. They're only found in one island and they're only found between December and May. So they'll be out flying for years. And then they come and they land on this one island between December and May and they mate and they lay their eggs, one egg typically, and they raise their chicks and then the chicks fly off around May, April or May. And you can see in this one picture, that's the, the adult with the chick, albatross. Um, and then they also have a really amazing courtship dance. This is, um, this is a video of, again, this is their courtship dance. They are the goofiest birds. They're, they're about two, they're probably about three feet, two to three feet tall. They're really big. But this is, this is when they fly in, they do this courtship ritual. And for a long time, everybody thought that they mated for life, but they discovered doing genetics on the chicks that the mated for life parents aren't necessarily all the parents of the chicks. So there are sneaker males that come in and have little, they hook up with the females when they fly in. And so the chicks aren't necessarily the pair that are mated. It's just, um, in the Gothos are also land iguanas. And here you can see a land iguana near a burrow. They feed on cactus and insects. Um, and of course, everybody knows about the giant tortoise. And the giant tortoises, one of the things at the park, you see in that upper corner, those are baby giant tortoises that the parks are rearing to replace giant tortoises that pirates and whalers, they used to come to the islands and they would take the giant tortoises because they need very little food and very little water and they can live for a long time. And so they used to take the giant tortoises, put them in the cargo holds of the ships and have them for fresh meat. And so the, the giant tortoises were wiped down on a lot of the islands. So the Galapagos National Park is breeding them and they've been able to replenish a lot of the populations and some of them are now reproducing in the wild by themselves, which is really a great thing. So that's been very successful. Um, there are also a lot of sea turtles in the Galapagos Islands. There's this one place where we go um, when we go snorkeling and some, I've seen over a hundred sea turtles, some of them sleeping on the bottom or just floating around, tons of sea turtles. There's a great shot of the sea turtles, the babies coming out of the nest. And I know one of you guys, I'm sure you know what, what determines their gender. It's one of my favorite facts I always tell people about. It's the temperature of the nest that determines whether you have females or males. And one of the things we're worried about with climate change is because when you have warmer nests, you get more females. With climate change, there's a lot of concern about sea turtles and that we'll have too many females and not enough males. Another unique species in the Galapagos is the flightless cormorants, and that's their mating dance in the movie. They do their mating dance in the water, which is really cool to see how they sort of circle each other. So the flightless cormorants, I live in Florida, and here in Florida, we have cormorants that fly. Probably same for those of you who might be in California, Louisiana, maybe some other places, cormorants there fly. Well, when they got to the Galapagos, they were flying cormorants. But what happened was there was so much food for the cormorants in the Galapagos, and there was no competition for the food that the cormorants didn't have to fly from one island to the next to find food or nest. And so over time, they lost the ability to fly. And if you look in that picture, you can see how his wings are like these little vestiges of wings. Um, they can't use those to fly. Now they actually use them like a tightrope walker when they're hopping around on the rocks, they use them for balance. That's what they use their wings for. And they have reared, their legs have gotten more muscular and stronger for swimming and diving. And you can also see on this one, they have this beautiful like turquoise blue eye, which may have something to do with why they have really good underwater vision. That's kind of cool. So it's the only flightless cormorant in the world. They also have the only true marine iguanas. Um, you might see iguanas, like here in Florida, sometimes you see iguanas swimming from one tree to the next. Those are still land iguanas. But in the Galapagos, the iguanas adapted and changed over time, and now they're truly marine iguanas, and they actually dive into the ocean to feed on algae. 
And you can see one in the upper corner, they put their, their sort of legs and arms against their body and they use their tails. The marine iguana's tails are flatter than the land iguana's and they use those like paddles to swim and they dive into ocean to feed on algae. Now, there is one issue with that in that they're, they ingest too much salt. And so when they're out lounging in the sun, like you see that one picture, those guys are all sunbathing because they're cold blooded and so they're getting their temperature up. They also repeatedly sneeze salt out their nose. So as you're walking by, they'll be sneezing and everybody's like, oh, that's disgusting, flying lizard sign. So, but here's one of the coolest things I've ever seen is if you actually get to see a marine iguana underwater because they look like dinosaurs. I mean, they just look like they should not be underwater. So that's, that's one swimming underwater. Um, on other, there's lots of other cool stuff underwater. The fish here are there a lot of, this is a king angel fish in the upper right hand corner. Uh, the Galapagos are also known for hammerhead sharks. And we see those quite often and Galapagos sharks. And that's one of my favorite sea creatures in the Galapagos on the right. It's the sea star with the common name is the chocolate chip cookie sea star, which I think you can see why it's kind of cool. Um, in addition to the animals, there are really amazing landscapes. Uh, surprisingly, there's a lot, we think about the equator, you think about tropics, but there's a lot of cactus in the Galapagos, and there are some islands where the cactus grow as big as trees. And it turns out cactus is also what we call a pioneer plant, which I suspect you all know what that is. You can see that in this picture, this is a lava cactus. It's one of the very first things that can grow on the lava and start to break up the rock to create soil. Um, and then I love this, the picture on the upper right is a place where we had one eruption where you had what are called scoria, which are pebbles that are about this big, that were erupted up and they created these sort of yellow, um, orangey red piles of scoria uh, pieces. And then after that eruption, there was an eruption of pohoihoi lava that came in afterwards and it kind of looks like a road through the scoria cones. And then here's, these are two of my these are like unbelievable Galapagos pictures. So the one of them is a blue-footed booby sitting on a marine iguana. And when the naturalist who took this brought it to us, the cruise director and I were like, we thought he photoshopped it. We're like, there's no way that that's real. And it, I don't think anybody will ever get that picture again, but that, that is actually a blue-footed booby sitting on a marine iguana. And then on the right are something called, we'll see if you guys, you guys probably, you might know the name of these kind of, they're a special kind of cloud called a Kelvin Helmholtz cloud. And what's happening there is that there's warm air rising over that island, but up, up above, there's winds that are, they're cross shearing winds and they're shearing the tops off the waves. And so they look like waves or shark fins. Those are called Kelvin Helmholtz waves. So I wanna, I'm gonna sort of round up before I, I take questions and uh, from you guys. I wanna tell you a little bit about fun that I've been having is that one of the things I also do is I write um, adventure books for middle graders where I try and combine nature and science into the story. And there's so many cool things in the Galapagos, I decided it would be the perfect setting for an adventure story. And so one of my latest books is called Escape Galapagos. And it's the first in a series what I've called the Wonderlist Adventures. And every book is gonna take place in some really cool place with animals or ice or could be underwater coral reefs, who knows. Um, but here's some of the things that I put into this story. So I love maps. So in the beginning of the book, there's always gonna be a map. And here's a cool map of the Galapagos. Um, this is a, the, the book actually opens with a scene of a marine iguana on a beach. And this is really a marine iguana walking across a beach called Tortuga Bay in the Galapagos. And I actually saw a marine iguana once kind of climb through a, a sand castle. And all I could think of was this. Godzilla. So the book opens up with Godzilla sneezes because he's getting rid of the salt, but that's all I could, all I could think of. Um, I've got white tip reef sharks in there, I've got turtles, and I have a really funny scene where the main character comes up onto an island, they have to go around an isle, uh, a sleeping sea lion, and the sea lion is snoring, and there's, there's drool coming out of his mouth, and actually that's a real picture of we went on a hike, and I literally heard the sound, I was like, what is that noise? And it was a sea lion that was sleeping and he was snoring and he literally had sea lion jewel coming out of his mouth and that's a real picture. <laughs> um, we of course you have to have if you're in the in the Galapagos in the story there's a an eruption of a volcano this is Wolf Volcano in 2015. 
Um, and this is a cave from the Galapagos. And one of the things that you find in the Galapagos, like in Hawaii and other places, are lava tunnels, where the lava ran underground uh, out into the ocean. And when it stopped flowing, you were left with a cave or a tunnel. And so there are places in the Galapagos where you, this was one we came up to, and you can actually go hiking through them. And this is what a, a, a big lava tunnel can look like. Um, so I put that in the story. Um, and then one of my favorite things is in the back of the book. And uh, I don't know, it's too bad we can't, we can't, I don't know if we can do like, can everybody raise their hand one way or the other, but I put in the back of the book, I put a, a section that I call real versus made up where I say, okay, which of these things do you think are real from the Galapagos and which do you think I made up? So usually what I do with an audience is I read them and I, you know, have everybody tell me which they, you know, I say real versus made up. So we'll, we'll see how this works. So here's a good one. Someone once tried to smuggle iguanas out of the Galapagos and was ca caught when their luggage started moving. So I don't know if you guys can, how many people you may be on chat or you can raise your hand, how many think you, people think that really happened? There's a lot of people saying they think it's real. Okay, how many people think it's made up? What's the, what do you think? I'm it, only seeing real for, yep. so far. You guys are right. It was real. That really did happen. And they were arrested. Okay. Um, how about a hawk dropped a snake on a visiting hiker? A hawk dropped a snake on a visiting Real? Made up. I think everyone's pretty much saying real. Oh, you guys are good. Yep, it was real. That really did happen. Can you imagine? It makes, it makes for a great scene, though. Okay. A woman fell onto a carpet of marine iguanas when her walking stick broke. Real? Made up. What do you think? I think it's like... 80% real, maybe 20% made up. Oh, I can't fool you guys. It was real and actually happened when I was there. We were actually on one of the island visitor sites and the, there's literally hundreds of marine iguanas and you kind of have to walk around them. And as we were walking through, this woman's walking stick broke in half and she literally did a face plant into the iguanas. And you know, we all thought she would be screaming and be like, ah! She, it was the most amazing. She was like, she kind of stood up and she goes, hi. They're very soft. They broke my fall. <laughs> what? <laughs> it was crazy. Um, okay, let's see. Um, land iguanas cut trails through the brush and rocky slopes. Real versus made up. What do you think? I'm seeing more real. Oh, I made that one up. They are actually really good at scampering under the bushes and through the dense vegetation. You can see their, you can see their trails by their tails in the sand. Okay, here's a good one. There is a coral reef at Urbina Bay that was raised above the sea in an earthquake and it now resembles a forest of giant rock mushrooms. Real? Made up. <laughs> I think I've seen a lot of reels. I've seen a few. I want it to be real. <laughs> <laughs> so it is real. So um, turns out in 1954, well, I'm getting some sun coming in through on my windows. Uh, it turns out in 1954, there was an earthquake associated probably with an eruption of one of the volcanoes and it raised the land up along the coast 15 feet. It must have been in minutes. And so it, it actually raised a coral reef up 15 feet out of the water. And so now you can go hiking through the old skeletons of the corals. And the way they discovered this was, I guess, some fisherman was going by and like, what is that smell? Oh my God, because it was all the dead fish. And so they discovered, but now you can go hiking through the old coral reef, which is really pretty cool. Um, okay, and the last one, if a volcano is erupting, you should run toward it. 
no, don't do that. <laughs> so anyways, so I just went, because it's kind of fun. I mean, he, one of the things that I really like doing is trying to find ways to make science and nature fun for people of all ages and, and encourage learning in different ways. So in addition to Escape Galapagos, which is my latest middle grade book, I also have a new popular science book out called Dangerous Earth, What We Wish We Knew About Volcanoes, Hurricanes, Climate Change, Earthquakes, and More. And that was actually just released. And that was, for you guys, it might be, you might guys might be interested in this book. What, what I did is I spent a couple of years, instead of, I have some basics in there about all these phenomena and how they work, but I really spent a lot of time talking to scientists and, and asking them, if you study climate change, what do you wish you knew? Like, what are the big questions that you wish we could answer? Or volcanoes. And I'll just tell you a couple. With volcanoes, it was really interesting. What a lot of the scientists who study volcanoes wish they knew, they just wish they could see the plumbing. They wish they could see the chambers and the pipe, you know, the pipes under the volcano to see how they really work. Because all of our evidence is indirect. And with climate change, glaciologists, they really want to understand better how large ice sheets, sheets and glaciers melt because we really don't understand how that happens and how fast it happens. So there, it was really fun for me talking to different scientists and asking them what are the things that they really wish they knew in those different phenomena. So that, that just came out actually. Um, and with that, I'm just going to open it up to questions. And you know, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so maybe I can see some people and Melissa, maybe you can moderate. Yep. And let's see, I will let's see. Okay. So people want to raise their hands if they have questions. One second. Okay, so Chad from MOA, if you want to ask your question. So, uh, so this isn't really about the PowerPoint, which was really great, and I enjoyed all the pictures and stuff, really fun. Uh, one of the moderators in my room when we competed, said that you told the Don Dishsoap Factory? What? What was that? The Don Dishsoap Factory or something like that, if I'm not mistaken? That, that I, I, yes. I did a little bit of work with Don, but I didn't. Oh, okay. Um, they, they asked me to, um, they, it was actually really interesting. So Don, you know, they have a big program where they donate Don Dishsoap to wildlife rescue centers because it turns out and so i went and did some facebook live and some programming with them on it so it's really cool so i went to one of these rescue centers and what they showed me was so if you have a bird that's oiled right you want to only wash them once because the washing process itself is really stressful for the birds and so somebody said well why don't you use organic cleaners well if you use organic cleaners you have to wash them numerous times and it stresses the birds out but it turns out Dawn takes the grease off the feathers in one washing. And so, and it doesn't harm the birds at all. And so they use it to wash the birds. And they showed me, it was really cool. They did a demonstration where they had an oil, just even an oil feather and they washed it with Dawn and all of a sudden all the feather came back out. And so, and they also use it to wash all of the pans that they use for feeding. And so it was really cool. So I worked with Dawn a little bit because we wanted to promote the fact that it could be used for these purposes and they were donating all these, all of the, the soap to these centers. And so we wanted people to know that you could use it. So that was, yeah, that's my connection at least. <laughs> okay, Jonathan Jacobson, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and... So when the person fell on the marine iguanas, were uh -huh. they okay? Hi, Jonathan. Yes, they, <laughs> they were completely fine. It was the, the iguanas. Oh, yeah. The iguanas. Yeah, the iguanas <laughs> are, are really hardy. They literally, they just like scuttle out of the way like, yeah, no big deal. I mean, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen sea lions sometimes with a bait. The pups, sea lions are really playful and they're always looking for things to play with. 
I have seen them grab the marine iguana's tails and throw them. And the marine iguanas get up and they just walk away. There's another scene in the book, and this really did happen. So there's a place in the islands called um, the blowhole on Espanola where water comes in through a fracture in the rocks and comes up like a geyser. And it's this shelf of rocks, and I guess one time, like a couple times, not one, the guanos will be walking over the fracture, and the geyser will come up and throw them up into the air. And, <laughs> and you know, we always say it's the only place you'll see a flying iguana. But they land, and they're like, yeah, whatever, and they just scuttle away. They're incredibly hardy. Oh, and here's something really cool about them. During El Nino's, that whole upwelling system shuts down because you get a warm cap of, of water um, on a strong El Nino and it shuts that upwelling down and you get a lot less algae for the marine iguanas to eat and so they start starving. One of the cool things that the marine iguanas can do is they can actually shrink their bones when they're starving and that's one of the ways they can survive better but yeah they can actually, it's, the scientists discover they can shrink their bones. Uh, I found a new favorite animal. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, we have one student in the chat box who said they can't raise their hand, but they have a question. Okay. What is the name of the raised reef Reef, and or how can I find pictures of it? Okay, so um, it's at a place called Urbina Bay, U-R-B-I-N-A Bay. And if you, um, if you Google Urbina Bay, coral, I bet you'll find some really cool pictures out there. And in fact, so you guys get me going. So in fact, one of the corals was used by a scientist who was looking at coral skeletons to um, look at the record of El Nino in the Galapagos. And there's a place in one of those corals where there's a core that's been drilled out like this. And it was 400 year record of El Nino's because coral skeletons you, it has two layers every year, and they could drill out those layers and use oxygen isotopes to get the temperature. And so they had a record of 400 years of El Nino's in the Galapagos from the coral in Urbina Bay, which is cool. Anyone else have a question? Um, okay, Matt, go ahead. All right, so, at the beginning of this uh, lecture thing, you said that you spent a few weeks at this Sea Lab thing off the coast of Florida. I want to hear more about your experience with that because I've always thought that was really cool. So um, I was the chief scientist for the Aquarius Reef Base, which is it's about three and a half miles off the coast of Key Largo area. And it sits in 60 feet of water and you're living in an undersea lab at about 45 to 50 feet six people at a time um, and basically what the advantage is so if you're living at 45 50 feet you can actually scuba dive down to down to 100 feet for six to nine hours a day so if you're scuba diving from the surface you only have maybe 15 minutes in a day so that's the advantage so what you would do is you basically sleep eat you know work up your data you can do communications inside the undersea lab but every day you go out and go to work basically scuba diving to do, we did, um, we did studies of coral, we did a survey of the coral reef, the algae, the fish, the corals. Um, we did another one where we were doing some experiments and we did a show, we were working with the Jason Project where we were broadcasting from underwater. But you can do all sorts of things that are difficult to do from the surface. Um, you, they have a, they have a, so they, there's the undersea lab, and then you have a, on the surface, there's what we call the LSB or life support buoy. And on that buoy is a compressor for air, a generator for power, and there's fresh water and that all, um, and microwave communication systems, and it's all connected to the habitat. And that's where you get your power, your water, your air. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And then you have to go through 17 and a half hours of decompression at the end before you come back to the surface. But you can do it right inside the lab. So it's not like they put you in some little tube you just do it overnight in the lab and it's not so bad. Okay, Ella, so you have a question? Um, yes, I loved your book, The Oceans, by the way, I read it this oh, year. Oh, thank cool. you so much. Um, and I have a super random question, but when you were, 
working on Moana, did you get to meet Lynn manuel Miranda? Darn it, no. <laughs> I didn't. Um, I did a video conference with them, but then I also, I was in California, and so they invited me to come to the studio, and they had, they had a big auditorium, and so I gave them a talk about ocean conditions with all of the animators, the producers, everybody that was working on the movie was in the auditorium. Um, I don't think he was there, too bad. Um, and so I gave them sort of a PowerPoint and I answered a lot of questions and it was really funny because they really knew very little about the ocean. At one point I said something about the leeward and windward side and they're like, you know, what, what does that mean? And so I explained what that meant and then I was so excited because in the movie there's a line that says, there's a fish kill on the leeward side of the island. And I was like, yes, that came from my lecture. <laughs> so it was really fun. They were, you know, obviously they were so creative and I thought they did a really good job in the movie of replicating ocean conditions and, and using real things. So it was really, it was really cool. I love doing that. Okay, anyone else have any questions? Like I said, you can put them in the chat box or raise your hand and I'll call on you. Well, while we wait for another question, um, do you want to mention your other book? You did a past NOSB presentation about some interesting creatures for one of your books. Oh, let me see. Are you talking about, let's see. I, I have a feeling they might like this just because of are the you, title. Are thing. you talking about this book? What yes, yes. <laughs> the one that's called Sex, Drugs, and Sea Slime. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that book, sort of the idea behind that book was originally, it still, it always was, um, it was to take wacky creature stories, yikes, oh, miss out there, to take wacky creature stories and use it to talk about biodiversity in the sea. Um, but as I started doing the research for the book, I found that it turns out there are a lot of strange reproductive strategies in the ocean to bring forth the next generation. And a lot of animals in the ocean use mucus in some way, um, whether it's to defend against predators, to capture food, or to travel easier, and that more organisms in the ocean are either being used as biomedical models or in the search for pharmaceuticals. And so this title changed from sort of weird and wild under the sea to sex, drugs, and sea slime. <laughs> so yeah, so um, if you're interested, it's, it's some basic marine biology, but maybe in a little, little twist. One of the um, coaches said that she thinks your best character is the bone-eating snot worm. <laughs> the zombie-eating snot worm. So yeah, some really great names. <laughs> um, let's see. We have one other question in the chat box. Why do the chocolate chip cookie sea stars look like chocolate chip cookies? You know, I don't really know how they evolved that way. They, um, uh, that's just how they evolved. You know, you think, is there anything that they look like to blend in with? You know, is it, is it a camouflage thing? Um, maybe? I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know how they evolved that way. But yeah, they look, they literally, they look very much like chocolate chip cookies. Well, I was like, happy to say, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Chad, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, through the years that you've been researching the Galapagos, what was the most interesting animal that you enjoyed learning about? Oh my gosh, the most interesting animal that I've enjoyed learning, you know, I've learned so much about the animals there from, um, I think the marine iguanas are pretty high up there. Um, the bluefoot boobies are, are, are pretty cool. Um, you know, one of the other things with the bluefoot boobies that I didn't show you is they're plunge divers. Um, and what they do is they fly really high and you can see them. They kind of hover almost and you can see them looking down and then they literally dive from high up, you know, right into the ocean and they, they can go down. They go down pretty far. And I've actually been diving and we were diving one place and we heard this noise like boom, 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 boom. And we're like, what the heck is that? We looked up and it were, they were uh, blue footed boobies diving over us. And they went, and then they pop up really fast. So they dive in and then they pop really fast. And it turns out they don't catch the fish on the way down, they catch the fish on the way up. 
which I think is really interesting in there. Their skulls are designed specifically to take that impact of diving from high up into the ocean. And so they're pretty amazing birds, really, when you think about it. So that's, I think, pretty, I've learned a lot about them. And then I think the fact that, you know, their feet, if they start to fade, you know, it's like, oh, bummer, they better start eating more. So, and their feet, when they're born, their feet are kind of brownish white. They don't turn blue until they become sexually mature. So there's tons. I'm always learning. Every time I go, I learn more, which is great. Okay, Jonathan. If you could go back in time, would you do anything differently with your career? Oh, you know, Jonathan, I thought that same thing. Um, <laughs> hmm. I don't think so. I mean, I, when I've been offered opportunities, I've always taken them. I mean, when I was at Sea Education Association, I loved teaching there, but I was getting kind of burnt out and somebody called me and said, would you be interested in being the director of a marine lab in the Bahamas? And I was like, mm, sure. And so I love the fact that I've gotten these opportunities to do different things. And in some ways I've learned so much more and my perspective is so much bigger by doing so many different things. Um, and I have such a bigger network of people. So it's not for, you know, the kinds of things that not everything I've done has worked out a hundred percent and it hasn't been fun all the time, but from everything I've done, I think I've learned and grown and it's taken me down the path I am today at in, which I really love. So I, you know, I don't think so. I would say the only, well, I don't remember, I, you know, I, no, I don't think so. I love all the things, the opportunities I've gotten and the different things I've gotten to do. Okay, any other questions? Oh, okay, Matt has a question. Go ahead, Matt. So this is a question I've been thinking about since I saw the itinerary, itinerary with your last name. Are you related to Dennis Prager of Prager no. University? I'll say no, okay. no. <laughs> Okay, it looks like Chad has another question. Uh, just as, have you met any celebrities while working on celebrity cruises? Have I met celebrities while working on celebrity cruises? Um, I have. I met the other, uh, a few months ago, I was at an event where um, I met a celebrity chef because we were both speaking, Michelle Bernstein, and we were both giving talks, and she was fantastic. I had a ton of fun with her. Um, who else have I met? I've met a couple here and there. Um, I've met some really cool people. Um, not necessarily celebrities that you might know, but some people that are, are really, I met this wonderful um, young female artist. Last time I was out, I was out on a, a trip who was just amazing. Um, so yeah, I, I've met a couple here and there, um, but that's not really what I, I do. <laughs> okay, any others? Okay, so I, you know, I will tell you, I did meet somebody who passed away re fairly recently who was, for me, was a role model and somebody I thought of as a celebrity was um, Jim Fowler. And you guys probably don't know who that is, but when I was growing up, he was on this TV show called Wild Kingdom. And there was one guy on the show who would like talk about everything. And then he'd say, and now Jim will wrestle the snake. And this guy, Jim Fowler was the one. And he, and he used to go on the late night shows and bring his animals. And he was a hero for me. And I got to meet him and be, actually became friends with him over the years. And that was a really big thing for me. So, when I, unfortunately, he passed away recently, but he was, a re, he was somebody who um, was very well known, but one of the nicest people ever. And I, I've met celebrities like in the news. I know some of the, I know people on the news, and like I know a lot of people at the Weather Channel. And one of the best things is when you meet people who are very famous, who are really nice and down to earth. Those are, to me, that's the best and use their fame for good. Okay, a question in the chat box is, what is something you wished you knew when you were in high school? 
what is something I wish I knew? Uh, um, I think, I, I think sometimes, well, a couple things. I mean, I think in high school, in the beginning of high school, I was pretty shy and um, I, I think I wish I knew in high school not to be afraid to take chances and take opportunities. I mean, I wasn't afraid of it, but I, I think I worried too much about making mistakes or failing. Um, and, I, and, and the truth is we all make mistakes. We all fail at certain things and you learn from them. So you always, it's always good to take risks. I mean, smart risks, wise risks, um, and try new things. I mean, I think as I got older, I was much, much more open to, oh, I'm just, I may not be exactly what I want to do, but I'm going to try it. So, so maybe, maybe that, and I, you know, I think I, as I got older, I got much more proactive and about looking for things and looking for opportunities. Uh, maybe I didn't as much as I, I did as I got older, and I think it's really important. Things don't fall in your laps. You really got to go after stuff. So, and I, you know, I was in high school, the beginning of high school, I was really shy, and I sort of started coming out of that. And so I'm just really glad that I got over the shyness. Okay, any other questions? Oh, okay, Ella has one. Okay, Ella? Um, where did you go to college or, sure. and or grad school if that was? Yeah, so I, I did my undergrad at Wesleyan University, the same place as Lynn Manuel Miranda. He went to Wesleyan too, as a matter of fact. Uh, Wesleyan in Connecticut. Um, and then I did my master's at the University of Miami, the Rosenstiel School. And then I got a PhD at Louisiana State University because there, there was a scientist I really wanted to work with who was working on like physical oceanography and coral reefs. So um, I went to LSU for that. Hey, Chad, was that a question or just waving? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't you trying to raise your physical hand to ask a question. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. That's okay. just what they do at UM. They put up their two fingers. Uh, okay. <laughs> my, my bad if it caused confusion. No, don't worry. Um, okay, anything else? Any other questions? Oh, we have a couple thank yous coming in in the chat. Oh, box. Thank, thank you to you. Well, thank you guys. And you guys, you know, I'm so glad you got to compete and take care. Good luck in whatever you do next and stay safe and healthy and try yeah, and have so fun. Okay, so if you guys don't have any other questions, um, we'll let you go for the evening. Thank you all for joining us. And yes, thank you for saying thank you to Ellen. We're very happy that she could present tonight. Um, she has been a fixture at many NOSB finals, so it felt appropriate to have her do a virtual presentation for you this year as well. Um, before we end tonight, you will hear from Amanda. If you're a team, you'll hear from Amanda shortly, but um, we are planning to do our awards ceremony uh, Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern. So you'll get more information from Amanda, but you know, get that on your uh, calendars now, um, and we'll be able to announce the prizes and um, how the teams did. If you haven't already seen it, sort of up on social media and online. Um, so we hope you'll be able to join us then. Um, and we recorded tonight's presentation. So if you have any of your team members or your coach who weren't able to participate, um, we'll have that link up on social media as well, probably tomorrow or the next day. So you can share it with them and have everybody sort of learn more about the Galapagos. All right, well, thanks guys. Thanks for joining us and thanks again, Ellen. Sure. Night, everybody. Night, everybody.